like to welcome everybody to the special meeting of the Board of Trustees of East Central Independent School District being held on October 25th, 2022, being uh, at 5.30. Madam Secretary, can I have a roll call, please? Jessica Hazard? Here. Jessica Friesenheim? Here. Victor Garza? Here. James Mulkey? We'll move on to item three, prayer and pledge. Mr. Stano. I'll turn it over to Dr. Fuller. All right. We bow your heads for the prayer. Dear Lord, we ask for your blessings on this meeting. We ask for your wisdom um, that would guide us as we seek to accomplish the goals on today's agenda. We lift each member of our staff, students, as well as every member of the board, and ask for continued blessings over each and every one of them. Thank you for the opportunities you give us to serve our East Central community. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God. Public comments. No, no public comments. With that, we will move on to superintendent's report. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go on 5.1 biannual ESL department annual report and certification expectation and waivers. 5.2 2022 state accountability report with assessment results. 5.3 2022 summer school impact report and 5.4. HB3 board goals and plans. Mr. Descano. Yes, sir. Trustees, we'll, we'll do it this way uh, because Dr. Fuller is going to put them all together in her slide deck and cover all of the items uh, in her presentation. Uh, all of these items are accountability um, and compliance requirements that we do annually, and typically we would kind of spread these out at multiple meetings, and it begins to seem very redundant to the board that we're bringing the same or similar information to the board multiple times, so we thought that we would try this time to do it all at one time for the board, uh, so it kind of seems coherent, makes sense, and not broke up. Uh, so at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fuller and her team. And I believe uh, 5.1 and 2 are in your electronic packet in their entirety. <coughs> and the the reports. So for accountability, we're going to talk about state accountability, um, and so that's largely the state's report on STAR with a couple other measures put in there. And then um, House Bill 3, to just jog your memory in case um, that acronym didn't stick, um, House Bill 3 is, um, is around the idea of getting 60% of Texas citizens um, um, college career military ready by 2030, and so um, it's trying to track kids early on and get them on, get them on track to hit that, hit that mark. And so um, all of that data is, um, there's big um, packets in, in um, what we've shared for you for the state accountability and for the House Bill 3 reports. 
And so um, in, in trying to synthesize that and, and get it down, um, we decided to use an analogy of like a battery. And so um, if you look across the country um, during uh, COVID, um, kids struggled a lot during that time. And they started using the phrase learning loss. And so I think that that's a real misnomer. It's like, it's one of those concepts that they throw around a lot. So our kids didn't literally learn, like lose learning during that time. But if you think about like a battery, like imagine like every year a kid gets a battery, like that's like one year of growth. Mm -hmm. So if a kid gets one year of growth normally, um, the second battery there maybe is more like what happened during COVID for our literacy. Our kids learned about half a battery's worth. So the loss is, is more like a theoretical thing, right? <laughs> Saying that um, we would have expected them to get more progress than they got. And so um, coming out of COVID, what we saw with literacy was that we're getting a little bit more than a battery, so we're trying to close that gap, right? Like it's, it's we're, we're getting close to where um, we wanted to be before, but we haven't totally recouped that yet. And so it's kind of the analogy I'll use um, throughout here a little bit. So um, now, now on STAR, that's kind of uh, how we did. And then on House Bill 3, it kind of looks at some of the younger students. And so with those younger students, um, we were on track with our pre-K goals, um, but we were not on track with our um, kinder, kinder through third grade goals. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Can I Cole. remind you about what oh. House Bill 3 is? <coughs> um, yeah, I'm not doing that at the beginning, talking about the 20 by... Uh, okay, sorry. Okay. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, so, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fuller, and she's going to talk a little bit about what we were doing um, in response to that. So Jennifer Casper was going to do this, but she's out sick, so you get me a little bit more than you probably want to oh. tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but what we're doing is, you guys know that um, three years ago we started with our literacy academies. And so as a response to House Bill 3, one of the things that the state put in was to really um, put those literacy academies together. And then the, camp the districts are to systematically send all kindergarten through third grade teachers through the literacy academies. And so we have diligently worked over the last several years to make sure that, that all of our teachers are getting trained. We're up to third grade this year. So this year, third grade teachers are all going through the Literacy Academy. And then we have any new teachers that are new to us this year are joining them. And so what we do is we started with um, kinder, then first and second, and then now we're third. And then each year, we just have um, the new teachers join them. Now, what's supposed to happen is, is if they're new, um, graduated, they get this information through the college. So they're supposed to come now graduating with this as part of their university work. So if they come to us with that, then they won't have to go through it. But if they don't come to us with it, then they'll have to, um, then we send them through this, um, through the academy. And so we're working on making sure that our teachers have the knowledge and skills that they need to teach reading at the level that our students need to be successful. And we have seen that as our teachers have, have gone through the Reading Academy, we have seen a big improvement in our students' learning. And so um, after this year, all of our teachers that have been with us will have been through the Academy to include our special education teachers. So that's where we are in our implementation. It's been a several year in progress um, work. So um, that's one thing that we've really been working on. The other thing that we have been working on is with this, this accountability is we met with Jonathan and Jennifer, um, met with each campus instructional leadership team, which is their principal, assistant principal, academic facilitator, um, and literacy coach. And they sat down and looked at what are the areas that their kids are struggling the most in. And they made a very detailed plan around that area. And so that area includes how are we gonna support the teachers, how are we gonna support the, the students, and what's learning gonna look like in, in that area. And so we did that about a month and a half ago, and we're now cycling back around to see how's it going so far. So we're having our first round of meetings to see how that's going. Um, and so we're in the implementation stages of that, of that plan to help be very targeted with um, our support and uh, professional development around that. In addition, um, you all know that we added literacy coaches two or three years ago, two years ago. And so each campus now has a literacy coach. And so the literacy coach's purpose is to be that on campus um, person who is the expertise. They have also been through the, the reading academies. 
they support pre-K through third grade, and they're able to go into the classroom um, to model for the teacher, plan with them, give them feedback, so they're always planning with the teachers, make sure that they have the resources that they need and help to coach them. And so that's a relatively new position for us. We're working right now, we meet with them through our office in a job-alike meeting where we pull them um, uh, about once every other week and we um, help make sure that they have the knowledge and skills, they feel really good about what they're learning in the Reading Academy and then how to support the teachers with what they need to teach from the curriculum and the resources that they're utilizing. And so that's another um, uh, support that we have that's relatively new that we've seen and gotten some good results on um, to help teachers directly in the classroom. And so what, what, what we have seen, as Dr. Fuller indicated, is our earliest learners are starting to accelerate their outcomes. So we're starting to see a correlation between the training that teachers are receiving in, through um, the academies, which is essentially the science of teaching you, and that youngest cohort of, of students now, because we started with the, um, kinder. With the kinder cohort of teachers and worked our way up. So yeah. now our youngest learners are starting to have the biggest um, growth. Uh, so we're optimistic that we're on the right trajectory now and that this training is paying dividends. So we want to definitely target support around that, and that's where the literacy coaches came from. Was, you know, this this is the good stuff. This is the right stuff. Let's now let's let's resource and staff around it so that we can sustain it uh, as we continue to move up mm -hmm. through third grade. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to Mark. Thank you, Mark. So continuing with the battery idea. So for battery <laughs> within year, um, our achievement is similar to what the national numbers look like. That's suggesting that we did get about a battery's worth, so we got maybe just like a little bit more than a battery this last year and now, but um, it, it was so much less during COVID that we're still behind. And while the reading was catching up and closing that gap, um, we're not closing that gap as much on math yet. It still has a bigger, a bigger gap from where we would have expected to be to where we are currently, and that showed up on our state accountability report and in our House Bill 3 report um, with those younger grades. So the K-3 was off track, but the pre-K was, was um, I think, 1% off the goal, and so they were, they were very close. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fuller again for some more um, of our actions with <coughs> math. So math is, um, what we did with math is we saw that our secondary students, quite frankly, were struggling a little bit more than our elementary students. And so we started this year with um, secondary as being a really strong focus for math. And so um, you guys have heard us talk about last year where what we did was we implemented a new resource for them. So they are implementing a new instructional resource that is very um, targeted, it's very thorough in the lessons that they provide. And so all six through Algebra two teachers went through the training this past summer and then they've continued to get support throughout this, so far this first couple months in, um, in the use of this curriculum, um, and I mean, uh, this instructional resource. It's got lessons that they have to follow, it's aligned to the standards, and it's aligned to the curriculum that they're using, but it is a more of a plug and play, if you will, right? And so it's, they just pick it up, do what it says, it has everything that's there for them, um, including the assessments that are already made for them. And so that's something that we've been working on them with um, this year to, to really pilot and work on um, to help to close this big gap in, in math. Our next focus is then we wrote a grant for TEA for um, the Fa Strong Foundations Math Grant, and that's for elementary specifically, and we were awarded that grant just of the last month. And that grant is going to then Similarly, like what we did in literacy, where we, we started to look at, okay, so what are those foundational things that we really need to look at and to create a framework around what that's going to be, and it's gonna be targeting elementary. So we kind of flipped it. In literacy, we started with the early grades, and in math, we started with the secondary grades, and we're going down. So our work with, the, um, with strong foundations in the early grades is starting this month. And so we've already got our steering committee, which is made up of um, people from each of the elementary schools, and they are gonna be the leaders that will help us to create that framework, to 
to look at our program to see what's working. They'll look at our instructional resources. There is an instructional resource that's very similar to the one that we have at, and that we're using at secondary at Fort Elementary with the lessons. And so they'll take a look at that, just like the secondary teachers did last spring to say, is this something that they would feel like would be useful and helpful and meet the needs of our students? And so we will go through that whole vetting process with them, much like we did with secondary last spring, starting this month. And so we're starting that work now um, in hopes that, um, that that will also be a huge support in, in our next target for math. In addition, we did like the accountability plans that I was telling you about for literacy included math as well. And so they each focused on an area um, that they're gonna be targeting to help make sure that they're growing students and really um, targeting what areas of math in their schools are the most high need and then creating a plan around those to meet their teachers' needs. Um, maybe they have a brand new team of teachers that have never been, you know, have never taught before, or they have a particularly um, low group of students that is really struggling and needs some help, or they're finding that there is just some standards that their that their students are really struggling with, and so they've made a very detailed plan around those specific areas, mm -hmm. what resources they're going to be using who's going to be going in and coaching and supporting, what they're going to be doing during planning, what they're going to be doing to see if students are learning, and then checking that data. And so it's a very detailed plan that they're working on right now, and we're just collecting that first bit of data to see how it's going. Mm -hmm. And so that's that accountability plan in both literacy and math. And so you'll be hearing from us um, probably as that steering committee for elementary meets and they start to have the framework for math and really to explore what are those things that we want to do district-wide, um, we will let you know what the recommendations are and what they really feel like um, would make the best, um, the best choices for, for moving forward. Just to I, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, across the nation, you know, I'm always looking at other places so I can see where we really are. And uh, math is, you know, everybody's doing very poorly at math, but I like what you said about targeting what the actual part of the, because you just hear, okay, they're not, they're not doing well. Yeah, not, everything. But, but, you know, how do you tackle that in, in order to measure the improvement in a particular, you may be doing a whole lot better in one area. That's right. And not as well in another and that. Kind of and thing. every little campus has, is a little bit different. And they have a little bit different, little bit different needs, different student bodies, different staff makeup and a little bit of different needs and so we're tailoring that plan specifically for that community of teachers and learners to, to meet those yeah, needs. Yeah, they said specifically Texas struggle, Texas kids, students struggle with math. Mm -hmm. So that's, I like that. Yeah, it's called the learning loss luxury, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So conceptually, what we've discovered is, you know, if you can imagine, you've got teachers who are everything from 23 years old to very seasoned veterans everything in between. Uh, when they got their teaching certification, some happened to have a program of study that was in mathematics. Others had a more general program of study, but they passed the certification test. So what that means is that you've got teachers who have a, a varied range of knowledge in mathematics, right? Very, very uh, different levels of math understanding. And then you have a very levels of teaching experience, right? So those are the two components to effective teaching. You gotta know your content and you gotta know how to teach children. And what we have discovered is without the scripted resource, the decisions that these teachers make are very different. And so what it ends up being is you have variability from the time teaching begins across a grade level some are teaching at a higher level, some are teaching at a lower level, some are teaching very specifically and accurately, some are a little bit off on some of the content and skills. So you have variability in, so what do you expect coming out? Mm -hmm. So what we've determined, at least our theory, and there's a lot of research behind this, that we can give them a, a um, high quality curriculum resource that provides that initial lesson for every day that is establishing uh, the level of instruction that we expect for all kids. Now, we coach and train and support the teacher in studying, we call it internalizing, but studying the content to make sure you understand the content with accuracy before you teach it. 
and studying the teacher moves that are going to be required of you, the strategies, if you will. So now that's where they're spending more of their time, and that's where we're spending more of our time coaching them and spending more of our time observing what's going on in the classroom and giving them feedback, um, as opposed to them spending too much time making decisions, which are all over the place, mm -hmm. about the specificity of the content, the depth, the rigor, um, and the strategies I want to use. So we're trying to reduce the variability in so we can reduce the variability out. So that's, for us, a really big shift, and we're actually really excited about it. Mm -hmm. But again, we, we started with sixth grade math through Algebra 2. We're starting to vet a resource, because we don't ever want to throw a resource on teachers. We want them to be able to explore it and make sure that it's going to meet their needs, make sure that they feel like it's adequate and it's going to make their life easier and that they're going to be more effective, right? And so we heard from the secondary math teacher, thumbs up, we've deployed. We're going to give the elementary teacher we're starting the next process. month uh, that same opportunity and, and we are very optimistic the direction we're heading there. So I just wanted to contextualize it mm -hmm. a little bit for you guys. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we're going to shift just a little bit to college and career and military readiness. So, um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to briefly remind you that although um, our college career and military readiness program in the district encompasses a really wide variety of programs um, for our, all of our students, these are the nine indicators that the state actually identifies as post-secondary readiness when it comes to accountability purposes. Um, so we're looking at, um, you've got college readiness indicators, which include the advanced placement exams, um, CSI criteria, Texas Success Initiative, which is also known as the ASI Pacer, um, and they can meet those through the traditional SAT or SAT or through taking that CSI assessment. Dual credit completion hours, um, three in, in English and a math, or nine in any other subject, even if it's a career in tech ed course that they're taking. Um, earning an associate's degree, and then honor resulting college credit. Um, the Can I pause you for just a minute? Yes, sir. So this means that if a child accomplishes any of these things, they start taking college courses on level. Okay? Mm -hmm. If they don't meet these requirements, they can go to college, but they're gonna have to pay the same amount of tuition for courses that are not on level, mm -hmm. and they're gonna have to take however many they need to take before they get to level. So they might have three or four math classes they paid the same amount of money for it, have zero college credit towards a degree plan. So this is college ready. And they're very high, it's a very high bar, quite frankly. All right. Thank you. Yes, it is a very high bar. Um, enlistment in the military, um, this is also another indicator that the uh, that CEA utilizes. However, that's been suspended momentarily. It's coming back in, and this year seniors will be submitting what we call their DD-4 form, which is their form of actual enlistment to the military. So if a student does choose to go into the military, they are going to uh, you know, be a part of the accountability system, um, but we, we're working through the process on that right now. <coughs> not not so. to disrupt your flow, this was an indicator TEA saw had a, a very positive response across the state, so there was suspicion that they weren't valid and reliable mm. accountings of whether kids had actually enlisted. But I want to clarify, for a very long time in East Central, when we reported to you guys the number of students who had enlisted, and we report that at graduation ceremony, usually in, in my speech, we confirm through the counseling department that they've accomplished this thing. So we never report just because they say I'm enlisting. Mm -hmm. We validate that before we ever report it. Is so we're already doing this in our system. I'm sorry, but is that why it was suspended? Yes. Yes, because TA wants to recalibrate and set a new requirement that you have to have the DD4, DD4, DD4 mm -hmm. so, which is verifying. They didn't just say that they were going to enlist, right. they actually did. Mm -hmm. But I just want you guys to know our numbers represent that. Yeah, I yeah. Saw the yeah. yeah they've always represented that, and so while we're seeing um, statewide a lot of districts scrambling right now to really try to develop a system for acquiring these, we're like sitting back and like, yeah, mm -hmm. And then as far as workforce readiness, when we talk about uh, workforce readiness, we have a couple of different, three different options for students. They graduate with a completed individualized education plan, which is an IEP, that they would have achieved through their ARD, um, and they would have workforce readiness. Um, they can graduate under an advanced diploma plan and be identified as a special education student. In other words, they can graduate with an endorsement, which we encourage all of our students to do so, um, and be a current special student, or they can earn an industry-based certification and complete an aligned program study. 
And this is something new that we'll talk about here um, in just a moment when we talk about our plan to, to increase the youth uh, for our students. So really, um, I say all of this to just um, say that we're doing all of these things already um, because our goal is for every student to walk across our stage post-secondary ready, um, not just college ready, not just career ready, but ready for anything they want to do. They want, we want them to have options. Um, just a little bit, if you um, think back a couple of years, House Bill 3 did also include college career and military readiness plans. And so uh, this is just a brief um, description of where we're at right now. Um, I want to remind you that um, although these are accountability guidelines, they're also directly aligned to our CVAS pillar. Um, specifically, CVAS Pillar 1 around student learning and progress, 2 of engaged and well-rounded students, and 4 of post-secondary readiness. So um, when we look at these, uh, we're seeing that we are on track with college readiness, uh, sorry, with career readiness. We're really excited about that. Um, so those three indicators were increasing, we've increased 4% over the last year of our students who are demonstrating career readiness in one of those three indicators. Um, we are, however, significantly off track in college readiness, which is not um, surprising given the information that we were just hearing across the country regarding math and um, literacy struggles through COVID. So um, we do have a plan in place to get that back on track. Um, we're a little bit slightly off track for our Speaking More Outcomes bonus, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means here in just a moment. And then we are on track for the majority of our special populations growth, so we have plans for the ones that we are lagging a little bit behind right now. Um, yep, I've, I've got kind of this comment. Yes, yes. I'm not a, well, anyway, let me just ask. If you could yes. determine what kind of right the question. Where are we with, with CAST? I recognize that we're, that the, the kids in CAST are pro pro probably not pursuing a college uh, um, you know, degree or even uh, military, but in terms of a career, mm -hmm. they are pursuing it. Is that factored into to that as well, or how, how yes, do you differentiate? So, um, these numbers that we're reporting right now are based off of our 2022 graduates, mm -hmm. um, which are only from East Central High School. Mm -hmm. um, and then the data that you'll see reported out by TEA is actually two years lagging, mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be different than this. But so, it will be factored um, into that. Yes, yes. Okay, when that they and there, we're start, we are we have already been in the tracking process for mm -hmm. them since they entered those doors three years ago. So, um, and yes, they, they actually have a large number of dual credit students mm -hmm. that have already completed dual credit courses. Because just because they choose to go into a career and not go to college at this point, once they get out, they still need to be prepared and ordered if they decide to pursue, uh, you know, college or whatever at a later time. And I was just curious as to how that how that. Yes, Look, we, okay. we actually anticipate okay. CAST needed to be um, around 90 to 95 percent of their students meeting one or more indicators of college readiness mm -hmm. um, and around the same to meet career, a career readiness as well. So we actually um, have Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In connection with that question, yes. that our students at CAST and East Central High School, our goal is, is that they are both ready for college, career, and or military. So whether they choose to enter um, a career path whether they choose to go into hotel management at a college or university, um, anything like that, that they're ready for that um, and that we've prepared them to enter into whatever they choose to do post-secondary. Right, and I was particularly thinking, you know, I'm a nurse, I was particularly thinking of those that are prepared and already getting ready to go and get their um, health, um, you know, certificate and that kind yes. of thing, because you still have to yep. be knowledgeable in order to, to pursue in those areas, which I was just curious. So the, the first target that we had um, was in regards to college readiness. And so, as I mentioned, um, we are off target on that. And so in order to um, gain some ground and fill that battery back up, um, we have been providing SAT school day for all of our juniors and seniors. We'll be switching to ACT school day next year. Um, and then from there, if the students don't demonstrate college readiness, um, we are affording them the opportunity to complete that TSI test to become uh, compliant with math and English um, prior to their senior year. And then we are also engaging with a new college bridge program um, that TEA has put out that will allow our students an opportunity to go back in and do some of that remedial coursework ahead of time um, and become college ready based off of that coursework. Um, so 
if they are not able, this in this um, ideal world, almost every student that we have will be able to meet these expectations of, of college readiness so that they would have the option should they want to take advantage of the free tuition provided by Alamo Colleges to all of our students, they could do so, or attend the university for that matter. So, um, our goal, again, is to see is that significant college readiness improvement in the next couple of years. Um, our second target was increasing career readiness. Um, and we have, again, we've already been increasing this, but uh, we have just developed a new process for our industry-based certifications for our students. And so we are now gonna be paying for one full certification per student in every level three CTE course across the district. So if the students are taking a level three course in their program of study, their teachers are receiving certifications in order to be able to offer them uh, the instruction to be able to certify in that career and technical education program. So we're really excited to see um, how that increased opportunity for our students equates to increased success for them. Um, and then we've also gone through and aligned every single cert certification that we're offering to the course content. So we actually sat with our instructors. We had them assist us in identifying the appropriate certification along with industry uh, committees. And um, the teachers were able to put the standards for their certification and the standards for their course side by side and make sure they directly align so that um, there is no um, discrepancy or anything like that when the students are earning their certification. They're learning both the standards set forth by TEA and the standards for their certification together. Um, so we're really excited to be offering that for our students. Um, and then our last one um, was closing the gap. And so I mentioned that um, we had a couple of areas that we were lagging in our progress a little bit. And so those two areas are special education and bilingual education. Um, so we are working um, with uh, our special education um, transition facilitator that uh, works with special education and our current tech ed programming to track our special education students' progress completely through a program of study. We're finding that they tend to start dropping out of their programs of study in career and tech ed. And so if we can get them to progress all the way through to afford them that opportunity to earn certifications and be college and career ready, um, and then we also have been working for a couple of years now with our bilingual education department to assist our um, emerging bilingual students um, to achieve those same levels of um, completion that we're looking for with our special education students. So we hope to see those gaps closed very quickly as well. Any questions that we answered for you? How will those kids apply for the, um, the two guys are gonna take the one certification um, we have a whole process um, by which the teachers submit a roster of students. They um, tell us exactly what certification they're getting. They have to be, there's very specific um, guidelines in regards to what certification can be offered. Um, and so that's already aligned. They then, then they have a whole purchasing process that the teachers will go through. Um, so the students really don't have to submit anything. Being enrolled in their level three course is what they, it submits it for them and then um, they'll take that at the end of the instruction for that certification course. So in some cases it may be mid-year that they're prepared to take it. It may be end of year. It just depends on the that. curriculum being written for that, how the curriculum is written for that course. Okay. So, But yeah, there's really not any kind of application process they have to go through. The teachers, for the most part, handle that through our typical um, purchasing process. <laughs> we got people out sick. Um, so you get me. So um, we offer three different components to our bilingual and ESL depart um, our programs. And so we have the bilingual program, um, which is our dual language program. We have our ESL, which is our content-based ESL that we offer in all seven of our elementary schools. And then we have a pull-out program at our secondary schools. And then our Lodi program um, is our Spanish uh, trajectory, our foreign language, um, ASL, computer science, and we offer those um, at the high school. So just a little bit of data. So each year, um, all of our these students take what the TELPASS, and the TELPASS is about seeing where they are in their English language. And so um, it 
is they get a certain rating when they take it, advanced, high, advanced, intermediate, beginning, um, or no rating. And so last year we had um, 1,288 students that took it, and you can see where they scored. Um, and so our goal is, is that our students are scoring on the higher levels as they continue to go through our program. So um, as we have them for longer, we want them to score higher and higher in their English proficiency in listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And so that's something that we work on and we, through the programs that I showed you, that we <coughs> support them. Um, we service 13 different languages. This one is just for, that's okay. So this one um, is, um, for this one specifically, we have, our English has made really good progress in elementary. So they've done a really good job and our students in our elementary schools score very well. When they start getting to secondary, some of our students begin to struggle. And so we have looked over the last year at our coursework and what we do to provide those students support, specifically in the content areas that they're struggling in. Um, we support them through um, like language arts and reading, math, those kinds of things, and have a partner teacher that's in there with them to help support them um, as they're learning their content so they can also help them with their language. Okay, so the next thing that we have to tell you about is our um, exceptions. And so what this tells you, to show you how to read this chart. At Ocrest, we, this is for bilingual specifically, so we have bilingual at Ocrest <coughs> and we have bilingual at Salado, right, our two elementary schools. We have 18 certified teachers total at Ocrest. Five of them are not fully certified. And so we're working with these specific five teachers to get fully certified. Um, at Salado, we have 26 total um, uh, bilingual teachers. Two of them are not certified and we're working on that. So we have 44 total um, bilingual teachers in the district, and seven of them, we are working on getting them fully certified. These seven are in these grade levels, and these are the number of students that they have that they service in their classrooms. And so we have to report to you where they are and how many um, of them that we, of teachers that we're supporting. So we support them on, um, on helping to prepare for the test, for the certification test through professional development. They also take classes um, to help them get ready for it. And then they take, they sit for the actual exam to take the certification. They have to pay for it and take it. And so we help them um, with that as well. And so that's, that's where we are for bilingual specifically. So just to add a little context to that, it's one of the most difficult mm -hmm. certifications to obtain of them all. There are multiple assessments that they have to pass, and one in particular is English language proficiency. So if you can imagine if Spanish is your first language, and you only recently came to the United States, and you're a fantastic bilingual teacher, but you, and you can pass every exam with the exception of the English proficiency, you're not fully certified. So in these numbers of teachers are actually some of our teachers who have demonstrated exceptional performance as a classroom teacher, but they can't complete all of, or they haven't yet, with the support that we're providing, we believe they will. Uh, but in addition to that, there is a there's a supply and demand challenge in yes. Texas this year more than ever yes. for any certified teachers, yes. period. There's a exceptionally upside down supply and demand for bilingual educators. So if we had the ability to pick from a stack of cordwood one little twig, certified teacher, we would certainly have all certified teachers, but they simply don't exist. So we're, we're, we're building to a structure to train, develop, support, et cetera, especially when they're demonstrating that they're great people, they're connecting with kids well, they're having an impact on their learning, they're just working through that process, very rigorous process of certification. So these five and two aren't necessarily just incapable. No. Right. They're working towards it. I just wanted to frame that oh, because yeah. not all certifications are created equal, and this context is different. Right. Just yeah. wanted you guys to get it. Well, what an investment, and, and it's going to pay off. It makes common, it just makes good sense mm -hmm. to do that. Well, and I might add, too, that it, it also might be a teacher that's certified in something else. They speak Spanish. They saw that we had a need. They were willing to that's step true. in and say, I see that you need a bilingual teacher. I'll step in. I'm not certified, but I'm willing to try to get certified. And so we have had some people that have, yeah, have really done that for us. Our kids at Grand Noble, that they've done that and are willing to go through the classes and the hard work. And like Sana said, it's a rigorous test. And so they're willing to say, 
I'll, 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 I'll sit for it. I'll learn for it and work on it first. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next one is the ESL waiver. And so a little bit different, but same kind of context. To be in an ESL, these are students who are in the general ed classroom. So they don't, they might speak English, I mean Spanish as a second language, but they might be one of the 13 other languages, or 12 other languages that we have as well. And they're in the general ed classroom with um, the teacher, and the teacher has to be certified in their content area and or the grade level that they're teaching, as well as have an ESL certification to help support those students in their classroom. So um, they have both certifications. So th these teachers, all it's saying is that they're missing the ESL certification. It's not necessarily saying that they're missing the content or the grade level of the certification. So they might have the math or the, I can teach second grade, but they are working on acquiring the ESL part. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that happens when we have an influx of students and we put some in some classes and then we have an overflow and we might have one ESL teacher in that class, in that grade level, but we got so many students that have registered and we might need another second one that year. We didn't have one on that grade level, so we had to ask somebody else to go get certified in ESL to have additional ESL students in their classroom. And so there's varying reasons, but this just shows um, that most, this is smaller. These are the numbers in these um, grade levels. And this one has already, the asterisk, they, they've already passed their test. It's just not on their, you have to like pay to get it added to your certification. Mm -hmm. They haven't paid yet to get it added <laughs> to their certification. So she's passed the test, but it's not official yet. So we don't get credit yet, but we're working on that. So this is the number that we're still working on for the ESL certification. And then this is for, then that was for elementary. This is for high, middle school and high school. Same thing, ESL, same situation where they probably have their content or their um, grade level, but they're missing the ESL aspect of it. And so these are the numbers. This is the, this is the um, campus, and these are the numbers of teachers that are missing just that ESL uh, that We're working with them um, and, and helping to train them, and then they'll sit for their exam and get added to their certificates. And so our job, um, much like I said, is to make sure that they're ready for this test. So we provide um, recruitment activities, number one, to make sure that we have them, but then also professional development to make sure that we build capacity so that when they go sit for the exams and that they have the, the necessary skills when they're in the classroom and they feel confident. So this is our wonderful teams at Ocrest and Salado and our um, their welcome back, as well as um, some of their, um, lead their leadership team. Um, that we need, then they either are bilingual or their ESL, they take prep test, they take the, the prep that we do with them, they either take a course or we help them with the PD, they take the test, we um, help with reimbursement, <coughs> um, and then they log in and they can add it to their certification. So that's just the overall process that they go through to actually gain the um, credential and the certification. Mm -hmm. And so that's it for bilingual and ESL. We are updated on all things waivers and exemptions in East Central right now. Any questions? I have one question. Are we allowed to do the three? Yeah, it's too good in French. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't speak it. Yeah, <laughs> I have two um, quick things I wanted to share with you, if that's okay with Ms. Cano. Um, the first thing is, um, you'll see in your electronic packet that um, we provided for you just, and we did this last year too, but we wanted to just to give you, it's a little infographic, if you will, about summer school. And so, it's not a requirement, so it's not one of those things, but I wanted to throw it in so that you could have the number of students who participated in our summer school, um, what the attendance was, um, how many camps we offered, um, how many athletes we had, all the things that are on there. Is in here? It's in your electronic packet. Oh, okay. And yeah, so it is, it just gives you kind of all numbers for summer school. And then um, we did a survey 
with the parents as well as the student. And so it gives you some examples like um, the family said 74% of the child's math and reading skills improved as a result of attending um, our, their summer programs this summer. And so it just gives you some snippets of things that we got feedback on um, that students said, educators said, teachers said, and then um, what, what was reported. So I wanted to just give you this if you could take you. Let me make you a copy before you leave today. Yeah. You want to do it? We'll do that. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. And then in your packet, you have a shiny new community based accountability report. I know, right? And so hot off the press. Um, since in the last you know, several years, we've gotten an updated community-based accountability report. And so this is the one that's for last year. And so this goes over all the data um, for the last school year. So I wanted to just kind of acclimate you to the format. So if you go ahead and open it up, you'll see the first page, you'll see some of our beautiful children. And then you'll see our growth, vision, and mission, and then your wonderful names listed. Um, then on the third page, or page two, you'll see the table of contents. And so this is where I wanted to show you that this is broken down by the pillars for our community-based accountability system. So you'll see the pillar one, pillar two, pillar three, and then they'll show you the numbers, the corresponding numbers to the page numbers of the stories and the data um, that will have the information for each of these pillars. Um, if you remember, we created these pillars about six years ago, right? Um, with that, with our community-based um, team. And then we had those guiding questions that we report to you each quarter um, that we go out to look for the data to see what it is. What we switched it to is a format that's more narrative-like, so we're telling a story about how we're exemplifying um, these pillars, and then we have data that either shows what we're working towards or things that we still need to work on and grow, right? So there's, you're gonna see both. You're gonna see opportunities in here as well as glow, like glows and grows, if you will. Like things that we're proud of and things that we still have, we still know that we have to work on. And, and much, some of that we have spotlighted for you tonight um, in reading and math, uh, CCMR, those kinds of things. And so um, we have, for each pillar, there is a committee that goes out and kind of sweeps the district to see what are all the great things that are going on and collects the data. And then Brandon and Mark Hom and their team um, put this together in a nice, uh, beautiful format for us to be able to publish. So we're very grateful for that. So this has not been published. This is you were the first hot off the press <laughs> community yeah, members nice. to see it. Um, so we wanted you guys to see it before we published. We'll be ready to publish uh, within the week. Well done. Very nice. So we were going to put it on, it's on the, um, it's on Thursdays for the Mountain Beauty. So that we can um, present it to the community. So you'll see it again on the board meeting Thursday. And it doesn't get put on the website until... We'll put it out probably Friday. And then we'll start, he'll start pushing out it out to um, social media. <laughs> um, the last, I have one last thing. Um, many of you have, and we've talked about that we have undergone or commissioned an audit for our curriculum and instruction. And so just here to give you a small little preview and snippet of what's to come. We completed just the visit part of the audit well, two weeks ago. So we had a team of about uh, six TASA members that came um, to visit us. They were here for four days, but they had prepped for it for about two months. And so they're looking at all things teaching, learning. So these are the five big focal areas that they're working on. Um, the district vision and accountability, um, the curriculum, those written documents and things that we have that are available for teachers and staff to utilize the consistency and equity, and this has to do with what we were kind of talking about tonight. Look at those materials that teachers have and the delivery of their instruction in the classroom. And so what does that look like? And Mr. Scunner did a great job of talking about that variability that we see sometimes across the classroom. That, that speaks to that consistency. So what do they see when they go from school to school, classroom to classroom, in experiences that our kids have 
um, in their learning. And so that's, that's area um, three. Area four is around our assessment and then feedback, feedback to teachers, feedback to community, feedback to our students and our staff. And then productivity is all around how we utilize our budget and resources. How do we um, look at our um, resources to make sure that we are spending our money and utilizing our resources to um, the biggest benefit and making sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our, um, our community and students. And so right now, um, what they've done is they've come to visit, they've gotten a ton of information, and then they're going to be giving us a draft report around mid-January that will give us, because it's like, you know, easy reading of about 300 pages. <laughs> um, and so, and then in that, they'll be giving us um, some things to think about as far as next steps. Um, and so from that, the curriculum team, along with, um, we'll probably have lots of committee work and lots of people input, and we'll come up with a plan for what are those things that are going really well, what are those opportunities of things that we need to do, and then making a plan for the next year, two years, three years, and five years out. Um, preliminarily, uh, what we got was really right along with what we had, we thought we would get. So they really talked a lot about the written curriculum. We spent a lot of time um, writing, making sure teachers have what they need. They said we are a very resource rich, rich, rich district, so we have lots of things for teachers to use, books for kids to have, stuff for resources. What we talked about today, that delivery aspect, is where we're shifting our focus to. So then you take that, those resources, and you work on that implementation, that consistency from classroom to classroom, that teachers feel confident in how to deliver the lesson, both, like Mr. Toscano said, the content, like not only what I'm teaching, the math or the reading or the science, but how to teach it so the kids are engaged and understand and know how to learn. Um, and then that they're checking to make sure that kids are learning and giving them feedback. And so all of those things are things that we have shifted from really that writing aspect to the delivery. And that changes our work to look like more in classroom, um, coaching, um, feedback, making sure that we're um, partners, modeling, and working together um, as we're really looking at um, that support um, going forward. And so those are our immediate next steps, but we look forward to the written audit and we'll be sharing um, our feedback with you when we get it. What's your tips and balance to know that you're delivering to the teachers? Do you go back and do a um, questionnaire? I mean, do they? how do you find out that they feel that they're getting the delivered to them what they need? How do you do that? Well, we do it in multiple ways. So do you hear we were talking about um, math earlier? No. Okay. No, 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 no. It's okay. I just want to point that out. Well, like, kind of. <laughs> that's not what I meant. But I was going to say that was the example. Like, so what we were saying was, so we try to. Oh, that's not. Boom. I know. That. We I try know. to. Um, so what we do is we, whenever we're doing a change, we try to we get a group of teachers together to review, talk about the process, look at any resources, and then throughout the process, we're, we kind of go hand in hand with them, right? So we're offering professional development, asking them how it's going sitting with them during planning to say kind of like, what are your struggles? What's going well, what's not going well? And then working with them and then going into the classroom. So we do a lot of informal checks that way. And then we do lots of, we do formal checks also by surveys, you know, to get that thing. But um, what we try to do is a lot of the informal side by side, we're doing it in two ways. We have district people and then we have staff people, right? And so we have coaches that are on the campus that are there every day, every week that we're trying to, we're building their capacity to help the support and then the district is also helping to support so there's like multiple layers that are there and we're building that structure and working on that I can see you're really excited <laughs> but I think the important thing is that that everybody's excited about it and it just and as you were talking about all of the other things in the math and it, it decreases the stress and all of that of trying to do all of these various, juggling all of these balls and you've got your resources and everything on hand, uh, right available and you know, and I, I, I can just imagine that does, that impacts learning so much. And so, mm -hmm. this sounds seen that. It really does. In fact, when the auditors had said, um, that when they were here, they went into the several classrooms that they went into that they were 
saying that they were an example of um, high level classrooms were the classrooms that they were um, in implementing the new math resource. We were like, oh, they didn't know that it was a new live math resource, so they just happened to tell us that. And I was like, huh, there you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was, it was very affirming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Trustees, before they, they walk away, I want to say um, you've probably figured out that these are very talented, hardworking folks, uh, but I want you to know that in the circles that are their job alikes in the area and in the state, each of these four individuals tonight and the two that weren't here are highly regarded, highly respected, and they're big, contributor, con big contributors in the areas of their expertise in career and technology and special education, career, uh, um, um, curriculum and instruction, leadership, and even accountability, <laughs> assessment, and transformation. And transformation. Like, this guy right here is well known, as well as these ladies. And I just want to tell you that, that I, when I tell you this, you just need to know that these are high level, unbelievable, talented leaders in this, in this department that we are fortunate to have here in Eastland. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the action agenda item 6.1 contract with Bear County Elections for November 8, 2022 bond election. Service President and Trustees, what we're trying to do here is what we always do when we are holding an election. We attempt to make the process as efficient and as cost effective as possible by asking your permission to negotiate a shared. <coughs> A contract with Bear County Elections for the November 8th administration of that election. Um, essentially, uh, by partnering with the county, we would share the cost of running that election with any other entities that the county the county entered into an agreement with. At this particular time, we don't know the number or which other political entities are partnering with the county. Um, so we're bringing a projected cost for the shared. Um, for our shared portion of this year's election, or the November 8th election. Um, so as of right now, uh, our estimated cost for the November election is $95,630. And so what we're bringing to you tonight um, is the request for us to negotiate with Bear County Department for the reason of efficiency and cost effectiveness uh, for the November 8th election and to authorize up to $95,630, which is our estimate, again, which uh, until it's reconciled with the number of entities that actually partnered, what our portion will be, we won't know the final amount. Is it normal to have uh, to do this? So, uh, yeah, Mr. Matthew, can you please move your chair? <laughs> <Probably Yeah. here. laughs> um, to know or to, to have or to try to acquire this information and negotiate after, I mean, we've already started early voting. Yeah. So is this normal? Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of the timeline. Uh, it seems a little bit awkward that we've started early voting which we've already agreed to partner by letting them use right. our facilities and all, this, mm -hmm. all the things. Uh, but it was in, until recently, and I think it's partially a similar timeline, and it's partially because there were a lot of uh, challenges to elections for the number of sites. Uh, through commissioner's court, there was a lot of pushback mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. um, the election leadership for requesting accessibility. So we're, there were a lot of demands for adding sites, which require added, added workers, et cetera. And so it kind of delayed the process from Jackie Callaman and her team getting out the invoices or the projected invoices. So, um, and Cameron could, could probably speak to the efforts that we uh, made to try and get that, but she apologized and it was kind of where everybody received it was probably a couple of two to four weeks later than we normally would, um, but that's kind of, was it on the news that Commissioner's Court was adding or trying to add a bunch more? Or yes. Yeah, I, I thought I heard that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And they ended up adding quite a few across and the And how the far county. is our reach to partner with, like, how far um, is Bear County or, like, close? Like, I know China Grove at one time had um, something on the ballot a few years back, mm -hmm. whatever. Would we have partnered with them? I mean, who do we partner with? Yeah, so it, it, we're really at the mercy of Bear County. Mm -hmm. Uh, and who partners with Bear County. Okay. Um, so that's kind of, it's, 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 so if other municipalities within the county were in the shared service agreement, we would share. Okay. That's good. Okay. That's all I know. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am. 
little more than it had been in previous years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've been from like 40 to 60, yeah. and now here we are. Like brand new. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Any questions? Any more questions? I don't have any more questions. All right, we're good. I recommend the board give the superintendent or his designee approval to enter into a contract with Bear County Elections for the administration of the November 8th, 2022 bond election as presented. We have a recommendation from the superintendent for the board to give the superintendent his or his designee approval to enter into contract with Bear County Elections for the administration of the November 8, 2022 bond election. Can I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion from Victor Garza. I have a second. Second. I have a second from Ginger Friesenhahn. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. Move on to 6.2. Approval of the targeted improvement plan. Sir, Jonathan Holbert, <laughs> Director of Accountability and School Transformation. That's it right there. <laughs> she doesn't wear a name tag for a reason. She doesn't take all the names. <laughs> it's all there. All the badges, yes. Uh, so fun. Our targeted improvement plans um, are a required thing for us to get board approval for. So I can hit some highlights for you. Um, earlier we talked about state accountability. Um, this is from federal accountability. And um, on the reports, um, it carries a label of comprehensive. So sometimes we'll hear that language of a comprehensive campus. Okay, so which campuses are we talking about? We're talking about Harmony and Legacy. Um, sorry, yeah, Harmony and Legacy. Um, it's the slide I'm most excited about. You've seen this one before. This is our CG process where we aligned all our systems. So our, all of our work with um, school improvement is based on our community-based accountability system, and then it has other systems. The one I want to call your attention to for this is the middle one, the effective school framework. That's TEA's framework. Now they borrowed very liberally from Marzano's framework, which is this one. Um, and so um, what, um, what I wanted you to notice about this is that um, we do the work um, before TEA requires it. So um, we start this work in the spring and um, the campuses make their plans. And so um, as they kind of work through what they wanted to do, then if TEA says, oh, we want you to submit something, we've already got a lot of that in place. And um, it, it's more aligning it to their template than doing the work. And um, TEA every year kind of recognizes that as kind of an exemplar and they're like, that's, that's better than what we could ask for um, from you guys. And so um, the plans that you guys have, um, they're, they're like 20, 30 page plans in there um, in your packets. Um, you've already actually seen all of that um, on the improvement plans. So um, you've seen it. So the biggest difference is that um, along the way um, for, for these um, federal accountability, um, we were eligible for grants that came with it that allowed some funding. So that's a little bit different than um, some things in prior years. So we, we were able to get um, $43,000 for each campus to spend on the plan. And so um, we're using that and kind of partnering with some people to kind of help help do that work and pay for subs and things to do that work. And um, we've got those plans attached for you. And um, what questions do you have about our targeted improvement plan? I don't have any questions. No, nope. that's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. I recommend board approval of the targeted improvement plan that is presented. We have a recommendation from the superintendent to approve the targeted improvement plan. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion from Mr. Victor Garza. I have a second. Second. I have a second from Ginger Friesenhahn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. With that, we will move on to item 7.1, executive session pursuant to Texas Government Code, section 551.074, consider, discuss, and interview potential candidates to fill a vacancy on the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees on October 25th, 2022, beginning at 6.35 p.m., convene in a closed meeting in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act Government Code, section 551.074. The Board ended its closed meeting session at 7.41 p.m. 
On October 25th, 2022, no action was taken in the closed meeting. We move on to the last item, adjournment. We have a motion for adjournment. So moved. Have a second. 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 All in favor? Second. Aye. 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 All right, we're done.